Hello, Night Nation. I'm Trace Trelka from the Sons of UCF, joined by Eric Lopez of the Black and Gold Banneret. Welcome into Around the Kingdom, Elo. Hello to you. Trace, hello. These are all notes. It's softball week. It's getting ready for the broadcast. But first, coming up on Around the Kingdom, which football road trip are you looking forward to the most? Have no fear, Trace, and I will tell you which one you should look forward to. Plus, basketball beat Oklahoma. Does that make up for that heartbreaker in Norman and the, the pigskin? We'll discuss all that and much more on this edition, the fastest UCF show around, around the kingdom. That is right. Before we get going with all of that, Elo, let's welcome in the third member of our team, Adam Eaton from the Sons of UCF. Keeps an eye on the clock, keeps us on our toes. Adam, hello to you. Hello, gentlemen. Happy February. Uh, it's, it's a leap year, by the way, and I want to thank all the audience out there for taking the leap and watching around <laughs> the kingdom all year long. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've been saving that one. I like that. All right, we'll check back. Get a few, Adam. Elo, you mentioned it, UCF football. We broke down the schedule last week. Let's dig a little deeper now. Those road trips, fewer, right? Five, including one to Gainesville. As we look at that schedule, rank them, Elo. What's the best opportunity for a UCF win in that? What's the best destination? And then we'll also discuss uh, where UCF might get tripped up. So how about maybe best destination, you think, on that? Well, let's start. Obviously, a lot of this will be dependent on where you live, right? Because if you live in Florida, for example, you probably are look, enjoying Gainesville because that's a simple drive versus if you're out west as an alum, then you may have to come east. To me, the best road trip from a destination standpoint, it's Tempe, Arizona, November, Trace. Like, come on, you're going to hit the golf clubs, get some golf courses in Arizona, good weather. To me, from a destination standpoint, that's a lot of fun to travel. But as far as from a football game standpoint, obviously Gainesville is the one everybody's going to circle. That's a, playing at the Swamp, which is one of the best, I would argue, 10 football stadiums to watch a football game in the in college football country. That, to me, from a football standpoint, would be my number one. But as far as just destination to, hey, I want to check this out, Tempe, Arizona is not too bad uh, from that standpoint. Yeah, I think from an ease of travel for most UCF fans in Central Florida, across the state, Gainesville is the destination. A lot of juice in that game. But, you know, when you bring up Phoenix and uh, Arizona State and Tempe, will that be the most attended road game by UCF fans, right? It's an interesting destination, but will more fans go there than maybe TCU and Dallas? A bit shorter of a plane ride. You can get a direct into Dallas be interesting to see, you know, fans circled Oklahoma last year on their schedule and Boise. People were interested in those games, a little less interest in, uh, you know, Kansas State. I'll add that one as well because of the first Big 12 game. I think those were well-attended games. A little less on that Kansas game. Certainly not a lot of people in Lubbock, uh, so a mixed bag on some of those. But I'd be interested to see what is the biggest UCF contingent outside of Gainesville uh, for UCF fans. You might be right about Fort Worth being that choice, TCU, Dallas area. The only thing I would counter there is I'm sure a lot of Knight fans have already been to Dallas and very for various reasons, whether it be mm -hmm. those teams you play at SMU. You've been to the Dallas area many a time. I mean, which yeah. trip are you looking forward to the most? Because you you're are you going to travel to all of them, uh, I would assume, unless, you know, the budget cuts, uh, uh, you know, around the kingdom budget goes down a little bit. But <laughs> – to me, you've been to Fort Worth, da uh, Dallas area before, so I can't imagine you're as excited about but that as, say, a Tempe. There's a lot to do in Dallas, and I'm big on picking up new stadiums. I was at UCF Arizona State way back when, when they played in that game, so I've seen UCF play there. Uh, I'm open for new destinations uh, and new venues. What is the game you think trips up UCF on that schedule? West Virginia. It's going to be cold, Trace. Okay. Better bring your winter clothes in, in Oregon. <gasps> Late November and Ames, Iowa ain't the prettiest either in October. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm not ready to predict that that is a guaranteed UCF loss, but I think that game in West Virginia is a challenge, Elo. Some fun with the schedule. Looking forward to these road trips. Well, of course, UCF will bring their quarterbacks to those road games. KJ Jefferson be the starter. We don't know who will be the backup quarterback. Trace, my question to you, though, is. Do you feel better about this quarterback room now than you did a year ago for the 2023 edition? Yeah, I like John Rice Plumley, but I got to tell you, going into last season, I thought at some point 
uh, injuries would trip him up and it was because he would put himself on the line on a play and you know that that came to fruition and I always knew we would see the backup I'm not so sure we see a backup quarterback other than maybe some mop-up time maybe that New Hampshire game that Sam Houston State game but KJ Jefferson has proven during his career to be durable and I think he's wise in how he uh, approaches putting his body on the line so I do feel comparatively that this is a stronger quarterback room going into the 24 season an upgrade for KJ over JRP. And I agree with you. I think it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out uh, the rest of the way with quarterbacks. You got to groom uh, some successors in there sometime. At some point, I agree with you. I look KJ and I'm a John Rice Plumley fan, but KJ Jefferson is a big upgrade over Plumley. I think, like I said, I think Jefferson could be set up for a big year. I am interested to see Colson, Dylan Risk, do any of them surprise and maybe be the backup and somehow beat out Timmy McClain? I know that's a long shot, but I think to me, Trace, you're going to be one of the few that will cover spring practice in the spring game. That's what I'm interested in. How do the young kids at the quarterback room look like and develop there? Could be very interesting because last year it was John Rice Plumley, and then it's Timmy McClain, and, well, that was it. We didn't know much else. This year, I think there's a little more intrigue because I got to think that the starting quarterback for UCF in 2025 has got to be on this roster. I just don't believe you can go back every year to the transfer portal. <laughs> Not when you have the talent of a Colson, Dylan Risk, or Trio that are highly touted. I mean, <gasps> what, otherwise, why are, we rec- why are we doing recruiting them? And if those guys don't emerge and you're constantly going back into the transfer portal, how do you keep any of these young guys? How do you develop any of them if they know that the, that job is always going to be plucked out of the transfer portal? So I do think you're right. It's an interesting battle to watch in spring camp. Of course, we won't get any answers, but it'll be interesting to see who may develop into that number two. Uh, back to basketball, Elo. Split. We've said this a couple of times this season, a split in the week between around the kingdoms. Uh, Knights lose to the uh, number 18 Baylor, but then knock off then number 23 Oklahoma. All in all, though, when you can say split on a week with two ranked opponents, even at home, that I think is a pretty good week for the Knights. I think when you say a split in the Big 12 basketball, anyways, <laughs> it's a good week. Hey, look, <laughs> yeah. o- that Oklahoma win was tremendous. Big crowd, sellout crowd. Uh, Nah. You know, someone here predicted a big crowd for OU. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll there were some empty it. seats. Oh, we'll get, to we'll get to that later. But look, they led wire to wire and beat a pretty good Oklahoma team basically by double digits. That's a quality win. Realize this. UCF now has multiple wins this year against top 25 teams. The only other time they've ever done that in the history in Division I basketball was 2019. I think we remember how fun that year was. And this has been a fun year. Even the loss to Baylor – I just tipped my cap to Baylor. They were really good. That was a good basketball game. I don't think UCF played poorly. In fact, offensively, they did well. They just couldn't slow down a top five offense in Baylor. But it's a solid win. It was a much needed win because when considering what they have coming up now on the road with two in a row, they stay afloat here at four and five. You hope you can split that road game and stay right around that 500 as long as you can. Welcome back, Shamari Allen, uh, against Oklahoma. A year ago, you and I talked about what it would have been like to have had C.J. Walker for the entire season in a season in which UCF went to the NIT, right? You can see, we don't have C.J. again at this point, but you can see the difference that Shamari Allen makes. Uh, Nine points, eight rebounds. By the way, Knights, 28 of 32 from the free throw line. They only went to the line, what was it, seven times? Only one of seven against Baylor. Big difference. Now, that's probably an anomaly on both ends. Uh, you know, they're not going to go 28 to 32 again, but it, it shows you that they have the talent, that they can win these games. And I agree with you. The Baylor game was a good game. Well, I think we learned that this de- team is better defensively with Shamari Allen, who's maybe, you know, I asked Johnny Dawkins in the post game, where does he rank as far as best defensive guards he's had at UCF? And he says he's top three. Was he with Perry? And, and he rattled and, off some guys. I thought his answer he, was he, interesting on that. Yeah. It was. And you showed it. He had five defensive rebounds, two blocks, two steals in that game. Clearly, they're a better defensive team with him than without him. He's a great ball defender. That was huge. Antoine Jones, shout out to him. He was fantastic in that game scoring. If you play, if you picked him in your game within the game, that was a fun <laughs> one to have there. Nope. <clears throat> but anyway, he they need that kind of scoring. Sellers had a good game. Johnson's had a good week. 
they get that third score. Maybe that's Antoine Jones moving forward. I've been impressed with him in his in his playing time that he's gotten recently. Yeah, that third score, it's it's changed up, right? You might see uh, Diallo uh, with a good game uh, in the points oh. department. Uh, Chi-Chi as well has come up at times. It'd be nice to see Antoine or someone be consistent in that third spot. Of course, the Knights winning that game by double digits over Oklahoma. They were able to do something that football could not do, which is beat the Sooners. As you recalled, football had a heartbreaking two-point loss in Norman. Trace, my question to you is, does Saturday's win over Oklahoma on the hardwood against the top 25 team of Oklahoma make up for that tough loss in football? This is apples to oranges. Was Dylan Gabriel on the hardwood the other night for the Sooners? Uh, I, I don't think that it does. I think football stands apart, which, you know, I think in my answer does tell you, right, Elo, that this is a football first school. And even a win of this magnitude does not make it more important than having uh, an opportunity to beat Oklahoma and Dylan Gabriel in Norman. So, no, I don't think it makes up for it. All I think it makes up for is losing to Baylor a couple days earlier. I do think, well, I think it does make up for because I didn't think they had a shot to win at Oklahoma. So it wasn't like, hey, we're supposed to win that game. Whereas the Oklahoma basketball game, they were a point and a half underdog in basketball and they were able to pull off the win. I'm satisfied with that to get that win over Oklahoma, a good Oklahoma basketball team. If Oklahoma was a bad basketball team, I would agree with you. What's the, what's the big deal? But this is a solid win against an NCAA tournament team it's got UCF, I believe, 67 on the net. I'm sure Adam will correct me on that later in the program. But they're in the <laughs> Adam's 60s. looking it up right now. Right now, that's why that was a cue. Uh, but I believe they're building a resume. Matt Norlander of CBS Sports gave him a shout out on the back. Like they're UCF starting to become a conversation uh, with college basketball people, and if they can keep winning, they are going to be a postseason team here at the end of the year. Ah, uh, four and five uh, at the break. We will get into more of that look at the, uh, you know, uh, the, the first half of the season. But let's bring back in Adam mentioned just a few seconds ago. Time for some silliness, our silly game for portion of the show. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, it is Super Bowl week. So this week's game is all about not the Super Bowl, but the fun prop bets that come with the Super Bowl. Mm. I'm going to give you some prop bets. I want your opinion on what's going to happen here. I'll start with you first, Eric, then I'll go to you, Trace. Here's the first one. National Anthem, Reba McIntyre's on the mic this year, folks. Reba. Over under 90 and a half seconds for the National Anthem. Eric, do you want the over or the under? First of all, shout out to our friend Brian Murphy. He loves prop bets. Nothing, nobody better. So let's give him a shout out for this segment. Over, baby. They're going to milk that, man. Everybody milks the pregame anthem at the Super Bowl. Over. Right. Trace, over, under on the anthem from Reba. Well, I, I will play opposite, but I think a country musician's gonna just going to stretch it out a little bit longer. Wow. I will take the I will take the under for purposes of uh, of having some fun with it. Was that like shame a stereotype you. shot there? Yeah, shame on you, Trace. Reba, more than a country musician. She's an American icon, sitcom star, okay. all that all good right, stuff. Well, all right, all right, all right. Uh, check the bio, Trace. All right, here we go. Next one for you, Trace. <laughs> will any kick... Hit, uh, field goal or extra point hit the upright yes or no yes or no will any kick hit the up that's a that's a prop will you get a kick <laughs> off the upright trace i like it yes yes i okay. like that one eric i'm gonna say no because it's in a climate con uh, con uh stadium so i will say no all right eric i'll start with you during the playing of the song america the beautiful which of these two players will be shown first Travis Kelsey or Christian McCaffrey? <laughs> oh, so if Travis, if if Swifty is shown first, does that count for Kelsey or is it got to no, be? No, 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 no. I'm going to go Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey. Give me the other. I'll take okay, the other just right. to keep it fun. Okay. All right. So, uh, Trace, I'll start this with you. When the MVP is announced, and he gets on the podium, and he's handed the trophy, and he gives his speech. Who will he mention first? You have some options here. Teammates, God or some sort of religious entity, his city, <laughs> his family, or his coach. Who will be the first person that the MVP mentions? Teammates, God, city, family, or coach? Teammates. 
All right. Taylor Swift. We'll get mentioned. Wow. <laughs> well, wow. So you're predicting a Kansas City win? Yeah. Well, if it's them, yeah. Uh, I'll. Wow. So <laughs> team, I not, will not if it's a San Francisco <laughs> win. There'll be no Taylor Swift mentioned. I will go with, uh, yeah, I will go with, I'm going to say the fans. I think they thank the fans. Okay. Right now, teammates is the is the uh, the favorite there, but God, That's undefeated, fair. just so you know. All right, next one. I'll start with you, Elo. The winning coach will have liquid poured on him. What color will the liquid be? Your cho- options are purple, red, blue, lime, orange, or clear. What color liquid will be poured on poured on the winning coach? This is the choice too. <laughs> this is oh, this is hard. This is big. No, this is one of the most important. It is prop bets of the year. Like this is the, probably one of the most prop, other than the coin toss. I would say I'm gonna go red because they all wear red as team color. So let's just go with the theme. Okay, trace purple, red, blue, lime, orange, or clear. Clear, clear. Go all right. Right now, the favorite is purple. Just so you both know, uh, purple is purple. the betting favorite. Wow. Right. How many times will Taylor Swift be shown no. trace? The over under is four and a half. Do you want the over or the under? Over. All right. You seem very over. distressed by that, <laughs> Eric. So this is this big. Is over talking about her. Listen, I think well, hey, that's Grammy award winning. Taylor Swift. 13 times. 13 times, times yes, as she pointed yes. out. 13. That's, <laughs> yes. a lot. Um, that's a lot. So this depends a lot on how what kind of game Travis is. Here's the negative. There's a lot of celebrities at the Super Bowl. So it's not like you can just focus on one. I'm going to go under here under the assumption Ooh. that Kelsey's held in check. I'm going to be bold here. Under. Okay. All right. And the last one, Trace, I'll start with you. <laughs> Will there be a proposal of marriage by any player to his girlfriend or boyfriend, I guess, on the field after the game. That would be something. No or no. yes is your option, Trace. Will there be any no. marriage proposals? Okay. No. Trace with a no. Elo? Absolutely. You're in <laughs> okay. I love it. You got a 10-minute drive to get a, get knocked up already. Let's go. <laughs> there may be a fake Elvis in the end zone. I'm just throwing point it out there. <laughs> there may be a fake Elvis in the end zone. All right. I, I have I have taken copious notes here, and I will update the audience next week on how you, you both did on the Super Bowl prop bets. Uh, last one, Elo, who wins the game? I'm going Niners. Everybody's picking the Chiefs. I actually think the Niners are the better all-around team and actually beat the Chiefs. Trace Trucco, I who agree wins? with this one. Niners, San Francisco gets the, gets the win. All right, check back on next week's Around the Kingdom to see which one of these two gentlemen is going to be rich if they bet these prop bets. Was that an odd number of props? Is or we had an even one, one two, su- three, four. I'm surprised five, there's seven. not a uh, no Tony Romo. How many times he's going to reference uh, Taylor Swift by like Travis is it fiance or something? Like I mean, I was well, Listen, expecting the that. sports books have integrity, Eric. I'm trying to find the most up to date <laughs> information, the Fair. most up to date bets here. I mean, there, there's some integrity here. Fair. Go Fair. Elvis. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, Elo. Back to basketball, halfway point, no one, us, nobody included, right? Four and five in the Big 12. By the way, two games separates the Knights from first place, also two from last place. A lot of bunch up. Grade the first half of conference play, Elo. A minus. I mean, how can you not be thrilled? Four and five in the number one conference in the sport, a sport that right now the league that's going to be probably an eight to ten bid league, depending on how things turn out in the second half. I remember, Trace, full disclosure, you were petrified of doing this show at this time of year. Like, what are we going to talk about? My goodness, there's going to be all these losses. What are we going to do? That's why we came up with prop bets, because we thought we'd be talking about a loss. (laughs) And the joke was on us, because they have given us – I mean, you're, let's be honest. Here we are in February, Trace, and we're invested in this team. People are invested. Uh, I don't know how many people expected that. To get four wins, beat. And it's not just any four wins. You beat Kansas at home, one of the best athletic Texas. UCF athletic events. Texas on the road, and you made their coach flip out uh, to get national story. And you beat Oklahoma. And, I mean, that's, it's been an fen- incredible first half. A minus. Uh, flat A on this one. Elo, let me ask you this question. Four and five of those, right, five were at home. The Knights now begin that difficult road trip, Texas Tech, BYU. There are winnable games on this schedule. What do you think they have to do in this second half to to get an NCAA tournament 
birth? Is it, is it going to be five? Do they need to go nine and nine? Can they get away with eight and 10? Will they miss the cut at seven and 11 because of strength of schedule? I know where they are in the net. How much does that Stetson loss earlier in the season hurt them? It doesn't help. It does sting a little bit. But more so, think about this. If they would have beaten Old Miss, that's another big quad victory on the resume. That would have been huge because Ole Miss right now is an NCAA tournament team. That's the thing that hurts them is they don't have anything non-conference that stands out. The schedule strength's not strong. I think they got to get to 9-9 nine and nine to be in that conversation to make the tournament and maybe That's win hard. a game. At, welcome to life in the Power Five. I, I think nine gets you into the NCAA or at least in that first four out, last four in. And I don't know, you, you may not want to hear this. If UCF sneaks into the tournament, I think they go to Dayton, Ohio for the playing the first four playing game, which is on a Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't know if you're willing to go to Dayton, Ohio, and then to another market for them to play two games in the tournament. But I think nine gets you in. Eight, you're outside looking in. I think seven or eight wins does get you an NIT lock, probably host NIT games. Some of this also depends on who they beat, right? And maybe a win against Oklahoma State currently bringing up last place in the Big 12, maybe that's not as interesting as, say, a road win at a BYU or a Texas Tech coming up on the schedule. It would be really nice to find ourselves in a position to talk about them at least splitting in the week ahead because of the difficulty of this road trip. I think it also depends on who they have beaten. If they're at eight, Elo, and again, that's a, a duplication here going four and five, they, they need something in the conference tournament. Right. And I think they do, most they fans the thought they were one and done in the conference tournament. But I think they've proven so far uh, that they, they could play with anybody in the league and could beat anybody in, in a conference tournament situation. Health is a factor here. Right. You see what the difference it was having Shamari Allen back. Uh, if, if he's he continues to play as well as he has in games. You know, maybe maybe they can do this. And no one thought that we'd be talking about this. At the I was going to say. I hope we don't turn this into, oh, I'm disappointed. They only won six or seven conference games because nobody saw that coming. I said take, I'd take six wins to the bank. Um, so I hope we don't turn it because we tend to do this with basketball, right? We, we, we get excited, and then when they don't achieve what, you know, because all of a sudden you change your mind on what they're uh, – they, they The goalpost move, Elo. Yeah, the goalpost lot. Like, you know who you are, you people. Don't move the goalpost, <laughs> all right, because this is still pretty remarkable what they're being able to do. And you know what's one of the been, uh, highlights of the first half of the season? Not only those great wins that we highlighted, Trace, but celebrities are now coming to UCF basketball games. Yeah. On Wednesday night uh, against Baylor, Adam Eaton's favorite, Robert Griffin III, was in attendance to watch, obviously, his alum Baylor. But then on Saturday, Scott Van Pelt and Stanford Steve had courtside seats to watch UCF in Oklahoma. Trace. Who's the bigger deal as far as showing up to the UCF game? Are you an SVP guy or RG3? You know what? I like both of those guys, but RG3 continues to show UCF love. Even though he sat behind the Baylor bench, right, his alma mater, he sat behind the Baylor bench. He still engaged with the crowd. A little shout out he gave the Sons of UCF that we ended Sons of UCF live with uh, last week. He has always enjoyed his time at UCF. Remember, Spirit Splash uh, during homecoming. He has fun at UCF. He does a lot of videos. He brought his family to this game. Love Scott Van Pelt. RG3 gets the win in that competition. You're wrong. And here's why you're flat out <laughs> wrong, Trace. It's SVP. Because that, you talk about awareness. You know what he did on his Monday night sports center, him and Stanford Steve? You know a little what shout Steve, out. Yeah. A shout out. You know what Stanford Steve was wearing? Notice what he was wearing? A little bit of UCF, that Defon's shirt there that they're doing at the UCF basketball games. You got Gus Malzahn going out of his way to talk to SVP. I mean, it. He didn't do that with RG3, did he? Did we get any video of Gus going to find RG3? No. Not that we're aware of. And <laughs> listen, that, that was awesome to see SVP getting the shout out and talking UCF basketball. That's great. Think about all of the attention, by the way, this first half UCF basketball's gotten from the Texas saga, which was on all the sports shows. Every sports show was talking about defending UCF. To now SVP and, and and Stanford Steve giving shout outs to UCF basketball. This might have been the most successful month. January might have been one of the most successful months in UCF basketball history from a marketing standpoint since maybe March of 2019 with Taco and the 
Zion and Johnny Dawkins versus Coach K. It's been amazing. Amazing. That's true. We talked about prop bets earlier. We're a little over on our time, so we'll play a little catch up now. Uh, we had Baylor UCF. Who scores more, Jalen Sellers or Baylor's Jacoby Walter? I took Jalen. Jalen outscored him, but you got this attendance one. I think there's a little asterisk on this. You said Oklahoma would be the bigger crowd. It was announced as it a was. sellout. I saw empty seats, Elo. I'm, there were I'm empty just saying, seats I'm official two, turn style. Was... Uh, I know. UCF announced a sellout for OU. They didn't announce a sellout for Baylor. I win. All right, you're up 5-4 in prop bets, prop bets that we put in because we thought basketball season would be a drag. We were wrong about that. All right, we got UCF at Texas Tech on Saturday, over under 65 points for UCF. I'm trailing. I'm going to take first pick, Elo. Uh, under, under 65 for UCF. Figures you'd be anti-UCF against Texas Tech. No. Nothing well, else oh. changes. <laughs> Over. Well, here's why. Here's the big thing. Why we put 65. You realize in the four UCF wins in the Big 12, they've scored 65 points or more. That's a key number to follow. You guys have had Sons of UCF Live. Our good friend Ben talked about the magic number being 70. I think it's 70. 65. I think it's 65. So let's keep that number in track during this road trip to see what happens. I'm going to say 65. I'm going to be the optimistic and say they get slightly over and steal a win on the road. And I think their best shot is Texas Tech. Sorry, Trace. All right. You called it. You called it. We'll see how that goes on the prop bet. All right. Uh, that We'll see how that goes. Speaking of which, uh, what do we got next? We got draft. Oh, the audience. Can we give a shout out to the audience? They've audience got is picking wins. up all the wins we didn't believe UCF would win. Clearly, they were the optimistic. We know that, clearly. Uh, they get three wins. You've got the one win against West Virginia. I don't think either one of us, none of us picked the road trip coming up. But <laughs> Adam hasn't been playing at all so far. Is Adam going to show up to this to game? <laughs> and then make, keep, keep this day in mind. All three is come in the second half. Yeah. If UCF can split these two road games, home to Cincinnati on the We're not catching back. the audience. No, we're not. And hopefully we're I can, me or Adam can catch you at this uh shifting gears hey you are preparing for softball season opener and an opening weekend what's the best case scenario do you think for softball uh this season it's first year of the big 12 a league in which you have what is it one two three time defending champion oklahoma in the league who's coming into the season with a 53 game win streak the longest in soft in division one softball history yeah look High expectations for UCF. They returned just about everybody from last year's team. They've added uh, a top 16 freshman signing class. They've added a three transfers that were ranked 14th best transfer class. So depth and talent is there, but the, stre the strength of the schedule is incredible. It's the toughest schedule any UCF team has ever played. So you can see this going a lot of ways. Do they take some lumps? Kind of like we've seen with volleyball and women's soccer that took its toll, even football to some extent, where you know the the you know the, the depth of the league takes its toll. Or does UCF win enough of those games and put themselves in position like 2022 and host a regional and make a deep run to their ultimate goal of OKC? I think all of that is on the table. They can get as far as OKC. If you told me, hey, they're on the bubble on selection day, I can believe that too. I think it depends on how they fare. And early on in the season in Clearwater and Nutter. But I'll say this real quick, Trace. If this team, this group with Cody and Doherty company, if they were to host another regional and get to a super regional or win a Big 12 title, I would make the argument from an UCF Olympic sports standpoint, this UCF softball era is the best era any UCF Olympic sport has had since Michelle Akers' women's soccer team in the 80s. I think NCAA tournament – for them with 11 seniors. Let's kick baseball to next week. Let's bring Adam back in. What did we get right? What did we get wrong, Adam? All right, Jens, I'm glad you asked a lot of stuff here. So uh, you talked about road <laughs> games. Uh, just just some fun facts here. The largest stadium that UCF is going to play on the road, Florida, 88,000. Second largest, Iowa State, 61,000. Also, UCF Arizona State mm -hmm. is the battle of potentially two of the top five most populated campuses on uh, on on the planet here on planet Earth at least. 
Texas A&M at first at 70, uh, 74,000, UCF at 68,000, Arizona State 57,000. So a lot of people potentially there. Uh, I did fact check this, Eric. You are correct. UCF will be quarterbacks um, on the road in, uh, in 2024. So I can confirm that. You talked about KJ Jefferson, uh, his durability. In the last three seasons, he's played 13, 11, and 12 games. So Certainly a little bit, uh, a little bit of durability there. Who's the quarterback of the future? According to longtime recruiting guru Larry Bluestein, he thinks Riley Trujillo may be the quarterback of the future for the Knights mm. in 2025. He likes him a little bit more than Dylan Risk. We're talking basketball for a second. Elo, you were so close. 66 is the current net ranking for the UCF Knights. Uh, you also mentioned UCF Oklahoma now one in two in basketball. Oh, in one in football. So we still got some room to make up there. Uh, the football uh, part was interesting, but the basketball part, even more fun, guys. Think about the schedule for a second. Nine games left. Three of the next four for UCF on the road. Five of the next nine against ranked opponents. So while there are winnable games on this schedule, there are certainly some challenges ahead for the UCF team who's hoping to maybe break into the basketball postseason. Mm hmm Tough schedule. Thank you, Adam. One more thing before we go with the addition of the title bracketologist to his resume for D1 softball, not to mention guesting on the 1012 network softball coverage this season. Eric Lopez, you are one busy man. I got a few hats these days. Got a lot of things between broadcasting on ESPN plus to all the platforms you just mentioned. Yeah, I, I'm trying to keep up. I'm just glad I'm here on around the kingdom, Trace. I don't know how you handle things at tax time with the W-2s. <laughs> hey, you you want to know. New episodes midweek, every week on the Sons of UCF YouTube channel. Also, you'll find it in the audio feed for the Sons podcast feed. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eric Lopez. I'm Trey Strelko. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for Around the Kingdom.